Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel. With me is the hostess with the mostest, Marveline Engel. Hi, babe. Hey, you're looking good. <laughs> Hey, and it see it seems so strange that uh, that we're doing this podcast. We're not changing the format of the podcast, but we thought we'd uh, try something a little different this time. So we're actually in two separate locations, same house, but two separate locations, and you feel like you're a million miles away. Does it feel that way? It to totally you? feels that way to me. And you know, now we can't do like the secret signals, like shh, I want to talk. So we'll, we'll just yeah, have to interrupt each me. other a little bit. It's okay. That's, we can get through that. I'm used to being interrupted. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, we're probably both used to being interrupted. But today we wanted to, we wanted to share with the audience, uh, this is the first of what's probably going to be a two-part discussion on secondary or vicarious trauma, or secondary or vicarious stress. And I, I think you probably know this if you've been listening to the podcast for a little while, but I am not a psychologist, um, nor is Marveline, um, but we are people who deeply look at life and we reflect on life and we've been both been through a lot of uh, psychological therapy, et cetera. So when you hear us talking about secondary trauma and vicarious trauma, please realize that we are doing this from our standpoint as laymen, right? We are not trained psychologists. So, uh, so this is general information for uh, those of us who find ourselves in the professions where dealing with secondary trauma is just the order of the day, every day. And we think of people like uh, emergency professionals. We think of people like EMS professionals. I just said that same one. <laughs> uh, uh, these are the people that are witnessing such suffering. And so we wanted to start with a little definition about what is vicarious trauma? What is secondary trauma? If you cannot pick it up from the from the the word itself, the phrasing itself. And so, um, Marveline, could you give us that definition of vicarious trauma? I can, and um, because I'm going to read it. But it actually, the, the thing that struck me most when we begin to delve into this is so many, uh, many of us have experienced it, do experience it regularly, but we've never heard the term before. And secondary trauma is the psychological trauma of being exposed to other people's trauma, especially on a continuing basis. And I don't know many first responders that that doesn't apply to, right? Not just first responders, a lot of, um, a lot of people in healthcare, but can you, can you say that definition one more time I will. for and, the, uh, and... the slow people like me? <laughs> yes, I'll say it again. And first responders in, to me includes healthcare, but, um, it's, I'm going to quote, uh, a simple definition. It's the psychological trauma that we experience of when we are exposed to other people's trauma especially on a continuing basis. The first person that I think of, obviously we talked about emergency professionals, but the first profession that I think of beyond that is social workers oh. and the ongoing um, difficulties that they witness on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to have a couple of social workers on the on the podcast. That would sometime. be great. We need to do that. Yeah. yeah. But social workers who are consistently witnessing um, the suffering of society, right? Absolutely. In a maybe a little bit deeper form than than uh, just working with a patient for a single shift. Those social workers are delving into it more. And I imagine it's pretty hard to see the conditions that a lot of people come from, a lot of children come out of. And um, I think it just makes all the sense in the world how that, could, that can leave some residue on you, 
right? It can leave some residue. It, it can. One of the problems with trauma in general is it's sticky. It can stick to you. It's really hard to witness other people's pain and suffering and to not internalize it, to not start putting it on because it sticks to us, right? To, to watch it hurts our heart. And, you know, there may be a spectrum of people that, you know, from super empathetic that it just, it breaks their heart continually. And there's some people that, you know, it's not as sticky for, but it is sticky. And because it is so sticky, that's when it becomes overwhelming. That's what leads to things like burnout or compassion fatigue, all the things we read about and hear about and know and witness so often. You know, I'm kind of literal. So <laughs> the first thing, whenever you said that trauma is sticky, I sit there thinking about going through the physical trauma that I went through and how oftentimes there were things that were sticky, like literally sticky. <laughs> and so, uh, but we're not talking about peanut butter kind of sticky here. We're talking about uh, emotional and what connects in the head and what connects in the heart. Seeing that suffering of other people, if it doesn't connect with you, that's too bad. It means you're not a human being, right? Uh, I hope that healthcare professionals will always be able to witness that suffering uh, because that's how we stay connected with who we are as human beings, right? When we can, the definition that we use with my pre-meds at ND is that compassion is witnessing suffering, being moved by that suffering, having the desire to ease that suffering, and then actually doing something about it. So compassion is a verb, but it starts with witnessing. And that's where this idea of secondary trauma comes in. Whenever we've seen too much, um, that's where burnout, compassion fatigue come along. I love that definition so much because I mean, I feel it and it makes it make sense in general because we're all told to have compassion. And the truth is we're wired to have compassion. You know, it's, it's in us. So it's not bad when you have compassion, but you know, I have, and Mark, I'm sure you have met so many healthcare professionals who were told in school, don't get too close to people. Hmm. And don't get too close to a patient, a doc, you know, you as a doctor, don't get too close to a patient. You as a nurse, don't get too close to a patient. That's right. Why? Why? Why would you teach people that? I'm sorry. I'm the <laughs> compassion guy. I don't understand why people would teach others that. But it makes sense because we're bringing up another generation that we want them to be resilient. And so the old school way of thinking is, well, you cut yourself off from human emotions of these human beings that you're treating and you you wall yourself away. And I, I guess I understand how that is a self-protective technique, but ultimately, look, whether you say I'm going to let this patient's suffering affect me, or you say I'm not going to let this patient's suffering affect me, it will. And over time, it will. And over time, after those uh, I think we, we kind of like to use this term around here, box it up, right? If people box their feelings away over time, those boxes become moldy and they disintegrate and some emotion spills out that probably should have been processed previously. And that's not any of our faults. It's just making accountability that we all have that ability to process the stresses that we go through. And um, I don't know, I, I, it, it's, it's one of those things where 
having been through much as much counseling as I've been through, I, I, I see such benefit in it. And I think it's always, um, a, a great first step, but there's so many other ways to tackle secondary trauma, right? Other than just going to counseling and therapy. That's one avenue. Uh, my training, as you know, is in narrative medicine. And so it's the, the notion of being able to use therapeutic and reflective writing for some type of therapeutic uh, benefit. And I, that's why I love to take nurses aside and give them the invitation and the encouragement to do narrative nursing. And that simply means to reflect on an event that is bothersome and write about that event. And then maybe even write about that event a second time, because as we go through the writing of our scenarios and of our experiences, we start to process them. We're giving them time to, uh, to kind of move through those layers of gray matter up in our brain. And, um, uh, yeah, I just I just think that we have a lot of options available at our fingertips and it takes some real intention to give ourselves those and to give ourselves permission to take those. I, I think it does take intention, just like you said. And, um, you know, I love counseling. I adore narrative. Um, that's one of my favorite tools. Um, but but maybe find a nurse friend who gets it mm. when you can talk about it, that you can share with each other. Some people have a support system at home, have family that they can speak with, you know, but it's really hard when you're carrying your own trauma that maybe isn't fully dealt with uh, or it reopens trauma that you've experienced because, you know, trauma isn't reserved for healthcare professionals. We can, it, someone we love can be injured and we can have secondary trauma from walking through the pain and agony with a spouse or with, with a child. a person, a family member, right? I, I can't help but reflect on my parents walking through that trauma with me at 18 years old, 20 years old, and, and did that ultimately negatively affect them psychologically, how could it not, right? How could it not? And how can we love others and witness their suffering on an ongoing basis and say, that doesn't affect me? Yeah. It does. It affects It absolutely me. does. And, you know, one of the keys to resiliency in general and resiliency in this setting is to hold on to hope. And, you know, okay, so what do I mean by that? That sounds cute, you know, whatever. The hope comes from asking yourself, how does the work that I'm doing that's putting me in this position, how does that work connect, number one, to who I am? It is what I'm supposed to be doing. And the good that I bring to the world and remembering one, you do this work for a reason and it helps other people because hope makes all the difference without hope. Our heart gets sick. And when our heart gets sick, we can so easily get overwhelmed and forget what's important to our life. We can fall into despair yes. without some sense of hope. We can fall into compassion fatigue and burnout that mixed with a little primary trauma from childhood or from adolescence gets mixed together and can become real overwhelming real quick. So I, I'm, I'm so glad that we're we're talking about holding on to hope. You know, whenever I think about hope, I, I just wrote this in an Ingalls Insights newsletter a couple of days ago. But can I tell the story about the motorcycle guy? The oh, other I day? love that. Yes. Okay. So 
a, a week or two ago, the hotness and I took a, took a road trip and uh, we were driving down I-95 here in Florida. And, you know, I am constantly listening while I'm in the car for everything around me. We're uh, a truck is passing us. I'm listening for it. If a motorcycle is passing us, I'm listening for it. Sirens, I'm trying to help listen for those. Um, He's backseat driving, and, in other words. I'm just. I guess I am backseat <laughs> driving to a certain extent. <laughs> so, uh, but so we're driving down the road and uh, we pull around. I can hear a motorcycle up in front of us and we pull around to pass this motorcycle. Now this is kind of this is kind of a, a, a not typical thing because uh, I'm just going to say it. Marveline is a pokey driver. <laughs> She's a slow poke of a driver. She's very safety <laughs> conscious, very safety conscious, uh, constantly on on alert about uh, what's the safest way to operate in this vehicle. And I very much appreciate that because uh, she knows that. She's got me riding alongside her who has been significantly injured in a, in a vehicle accident. So it's understandable why our family would, uh, would be a little more conscientious about, about driving. So anyway, we're driving down the road. We pass this motorcycle. And as we pull past him, Marveline says, I'm just going to give you a little 411 on this driver. So he's driving the speed limit. He's wearing a helmet. He's doing all the things right. And he also is wearing a shirt that has big block lettering. And across the back, it reads, recovery is possible. Recovery is possible. And I, for one, felt a lot of hope when hearing about that guy's shirt. To me, that guy's shirt is a piece of ministry because it is encouraging people to hold on to hope that there is a life after alcoholism, after drug addiction, um, et cetera, et cetera. And by three words on the back of a motorcycle rider's shirt, it, it reinforced this idea of hope hope for those who have been traumatized, whether it's primary or secondary, hope is out there. Hope is out there. And okay. So I'm a little teary, just hearing it again. Um, and so you can imagine what I did in the car when I saw it, uh, that moved me so much that someone random that I didn't even know had taken the time to do something to offer hope and encouragement and show he really showed his own resiliency and, you know, just like trauma is sticky. Resilience is sticky. It's the same yeah, strength is it sticky. Is. So one of the other keys to dealing with secondary trauma is to expose yourself to the people that are resilient. And how do you do that? Besides following a motorcycle guy, you, um, you can read books, you can attend lectures by, you know, somebody like Mark single is a good start. You can, um, attend those. You can watch TV shows about people who've overcome things. You know, we've got all the options in the world. we have to intentionally look for resilience, look for that hope, because when we are continually exposed to trauma, it becomes so easy to see only trauma everywhere we look. It's a natural reaction. We, this is our life. This is our lived experience. So we can feel traumatized even when there's nothing really going on. We still feel it because it's all we look for and it gets bigger and bigger. But resiliency is sticky. 
So don't forget to look for the good. Don't forget what you bring to the world is making the world better. And it is truly who you are. It is a beautiful thing. It is a good thing. It is a hard thing. But you're doing it. And we are so proud of you. And we appreciate you because we are patients. <laughs> we are patients. And uh, those of you who are staying in the game, those of you who still have the skin in the game and the heart uh, and the hope for taking care of individuals, helping greater humanity, that's something to be really proud of. And we are really proud of you all. And we are really grateful that you have tuned in to this episode of Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. This is the podcast where we teach compassionate communication, provide perspective, and inspire resilience. We want to ask everyone to continue to share and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, those are ways that help us get the word out. And if you have some ideas for how you have overcome secondary trauma, please drop those in the comments. We'd really love to hear from you. Thank you all so much for being with Marveline and I on this episode. Any closing thoughts, dear? Uh, no, I'm, I look forward to reading your experience with overcoming secondary trauma specifically. And um, yeah, so leave us a note. And um, we're excited about that. And we'll be back uh, with part two of secondary trauma. Yep. See you all next time. Thanks again for tuning in to Compassion and Courage Conversations in Healthcare.